Okay, thank you for your comments last time. Um, there were a couple of things that I wanted to clarify. I think I miscommunicated when we were talking about these logical fallacies. The one that I brought up was the argument from authority. It doesn't say that you can't put uh, credence or credi give credibility to someone with authority. I'm gonna to listen to my doctor, obviously. Um, what it says is that you, the arguments that someone makes does not, uh, the, the quality of the argument doesn't change because of the person's authority. Someone with a lot of authority can still make bad arguments. And so when we talk about degrees that we have or, or the experience that we have, we're trying to sort of say, you, you know, listen, I'm an authority and you should believe me because, you know, that's the fallacy. No matter what our authority is, our experience, our training, our arguments still have to stand on their own two feet. And, and that's why I, I brought that up because we, we want to make this as clear as we can to anyone who's listening, if anyone is listening or watching. And so we want to make sure that we avoid those kind of, um, the fallacies of, of you know, those, re those faulty ways of reasoning. Um, there was something uh, that you brought up that is very common. I run into it all the time that I wanted to address too. And that was, if I did this experiment, and for anyone who you know, didn't watch the last time, there were two bins and two plastic tubs, both with potting mix. One, I had nurtured a population of different bugs in, isopods and springtails, for about three months. I got the population really robust. And the other one was just the miracle growth. And I cut up some of my, my whippet's poop and you know, laid it out in the two tubs, and I very, very lightly covered them with substrate and covered them up with plastic and, and watched them over a course of three weeks. The feces in both of the bins, both of the tubs, are um, decomposed at the same rate. And my conclusion was that the, the presence of the bugs did not impact the rate of decomposition. And you, you said, listen, that's simply not valid because there were so many variables that I didn't take into consideration in my experiment. And this, it's something I hear all the time. You know, people have said this to me for, for months now. And the problem with that is that, you know, you said a long list of things like, I didn't know, I didn't even identify the species of springtail and the soil chemistry or the temperature and all these variables that I didn't take into consideration. The problem with that sort of line of reasoning is that I'm not looking at different species of springtails. I'm not looking at different, the impact of different temperatures. I'm looking at a system, you know, a simple bioactive system, which I tried to sort of recreate in some way in these plastic tubs. The same substrate I'm using here, the same bugs that are common in the, in the hobby here, same temperature, same humidity. And so the results are reflective of what I was exploring. And so they are valid. You, know, you can make other arguments. Um, I had a person say, um, well, that dog feces is totally different. You can't compare it with frog feces. And I said, well, how are they different? How would their differences impact the results of this experiment? And he was like, well, the dog eats food that has fillers in it. And I said, well, how would that impact this? He had no idea. He was tossing things out there. The, the, uh, the arguments that we use, we want them to be valid because we want people to learn things here. When we talk about arguments from authority, I've got a short story, I promise it's short. A year or two ago, I was debating with, um, on a popular Facebook group, her, hus her, her husbandry, and I was explaining why you never want to put topsoil in a vivarium. No topsoil, not even a teaspoon of topsoil. There's a problem a little bit because in Europe, topsoil is something different than it is in the U.S. And th there was an argument going on, or you know. And uh, one person in the argument, a young woman, started a whole new thread at the top, and in all capital letters, she writes, 
soil scientist here. No, she wrote actual soil scientist here. And then she goes on to make a bunch of really, really dumb arguments. Just absurd, literally laughable arguments. So laughable, in fact, I called the woman who has for decades run a topsoil company south of here and, and was asking her these questions that you know came up in this woman's discussion. And she literally she stopped and said, what in the world are you getting at? Why are you asking me these questions? And I told her what happened and what some of the things that this person had asserted. She literally had to put the phone down. She was laughing so hard. You know, they were utterly absurd. But people on the group were saying, hey, Joe, she's an actual soil scientist, you know. And so her arguments were given a huge amount of weight because of her, her status, which was, a, in the end, it turned out she was kind of a pretend status. She was more of a lab rat than an actual soil scientist. So we want to avoid that kind of assertions of authority in, in, in our discussions here. There, there was a, another thing that came up often in, in your rebuttal, which is, again, are very common. And these are sort of in the realm of like, just not very good analogies. Like for instance, you said, you know, we have seat belts in cars and therefore bugs in vivariums. I think you understand that those are not related. One does not enlighten us about the other at all. So those analogies we, we make have to be, we have to be careful about. Another one that is, you made, which is, is interesting, and you're not alone in making this one either. It's quite common where people say, the argument goes something like, nature is good, recreating nature in our captive environments is therefore good. And the, you know, the fact is nature is not good. I think that's called uh, begging the question. Maybe somebody will write in and clarify that. Nature is cruel. You know, 90 some percent of all the babies born in nature are dead before they reach reproductive age. So we can't make that argument that because it exists in nature, nematodes, uh, for instance, floods, temperature extremes, that we need to emulate it in our captive environments. We take the very best things, the things that, that the animals have evolved to interact with and try to replicate them. That's really hard. You know, if you look at like the, the group that I'm consistently impressed with is the reptile lighting group, where there's real research that's going on. It looks at the impact of various radiation, you know, on the physiology of the animals. That's hard. That is, I mean, that, that stuff is always over my head, but it's fascinating. And that's the stuff that we should be focusing on, the things that we think that, I, that make a difference. We're sure that they make a difference. Um, and, and, and that, so that little bit about nature in there is, is, a, is something we need to, we, stop, we gotta stop trying to make that, pretend that that's true. Um, you're then moving on to the, the subject of, of the bugs in particular. Your argument sort of pr is premised by the assertion that bugs are easy. You said something about, you know, they cost eight bucks, you chuck them in there, you're done. The problem with that, just a second, my exhaust system just kicked, kicked on my trailer off. The problem, what was I talking about? Oh, the problem with that assertion, that sort of underlying premise, is that if they're easy and we don't have to pay attention to them, then they can't be important. If you go on to say, and you do, that they're very important for a number of different reasons. Now, I assert that they're not important, and I have a lot of evidence for the fact that they're not important. All kinds of evidence all around me. And so you have, to, you have to argue they're important because, you know, even though this works, this is not good enough because you're missing something. But if they're important, as you assert they are, then they're not easy. This guy here, you know Arcadia Reptile or Arcadia Lighting, a reputable company who has kind of a, I almost think of them as like a guru of, um, of, of like new ideas. 
John something, I can't remember his last name, but he has a book on bioactivity that's kind of like the Bible for people who are, are interested in complex bioactivity. And he just recently released, he and another author, an online book. I don't know if you can see it. I don't know how the video reacts to that. He talked, it's called, um, let me see here. It's called, Create Your Own Stunning Planted Bioactive Vivarium. And John Courtney Smith, John Courtney Dash Smith. And he talks about bugs in here and he loves them. He thinks they're really important, just like you do. And he goes on at length about how to, I don't know if you can see that how to maintain them, because he says they're vitally important. And in order to maintain them, he says, you need to first buy them and introduce them. Then you need to adjust the environmental parameters, miss them, uh, in order to make sure that they're thriving. He says you need to feed them, and they actually have a, uh, a product here called, let me see if I can do this, custodian fuel from Arcadia. You actually have to feed them. And then he has different techniques for um, assessing the population's health, which if they're important, you have to do that. I mean, you could have a, a disease wipe them all out one week, the next week you don't have them. And if they're important, you have to have them. And so you have to assess the population. And then he talks about introducing new populations, you know, periodically to, to bolster the, the numbers overall. So you can't have it both ways. You know, it's either important in which case you have to put time, energy, resources into it, or it's not important, in which case you can just chuck them in there and ignore them. But if it's important, and you say it is, it's important in three ways that you, you lay out. One of them is nutritionally in the diet. One of them is um, aeration in the substrate, and one of them is disease control. The disease control I've already shown that the bugs don't contribute to the breakdown of feces, and I'm gonna to continue to look at that. Um, I, I think I've shown that they don't, and so there is no disease. You, you were talking about the feces being a sort of a source for disease, I think. Well, if, they, if the bugs don't break them down any quicker than the bacteria, and remember, all the bugs can do is turn big poo into small poo. You know, the bacteria still has to break it down. It's still feces. So the, if they don't do that, then they don't, they don't reduce the risk of disease. That was pretty easy to address. Um, aeration, let's do nutrition next. You know, you say that these bugs have a great deal of nutritional value to them. Well, if that's true, then that is our responsibility to provide that. We can't leave it up to chance. You know, we can't... We can't hope that they're getting that nutrition. We can't say, well, I'm just gonna feed them about 70% this week because I'm pretty sure they're getting some other nutrition in there. That's not something we can do. As, as owners, we have a responsibility to make sure that they have 120% of the, of, you know, the availability has to be abundant to make sure that they're getting the, the nutrition they need, at which point the bugs are no longer necessary for, for, for supplemental nutrition. So again, there, that's, that argument does not hold water. I raise frogs and lizards and turtles and snakes in bioactive enclosures, and I make sure they all get the food that they need. Um, and the third one, the aeration, you know, I showed last time that if you have the right uh, substrate, aeration is not an issue. Um, you talked about farm fields and lawns. Farm fields have 18,000 pound tractors rolling over the top of them. And lawns are made up of mineral, mineral soils, which we know compact. Um, potting mix is much, much more resistant to that compaction, as long as it's not abused with overwatering. The number one mistake everybody seems to make. You made an interesting point about a potted plant and how a potted plant has a drainage layer and how, um, how important that is to, not to let water pool. And I actually have a pot here. Because without this, nobody knows what a pot actually looks like. This is a plant I'm trying to rescue. 
this pot is very deep, right? Like you were saying, and it has a drainage um, hole down here. It has a relatively small surface area. Gas exchange to the bottom of this pot is difficult and evaporation from the bottom of this pot is difficult. That drainage is, is important, especially given the fact that almost everybody overwaters houseplants, just like they do overwater vivariums. So in a vivarium, the surface area is very large and it's, the volume is very small. So there's, the gas exchange here is not a problem like it is here. And the evaporation from the, all the way from the bottom is not a problem. I see it all the time. And so those issues of compaction that you say bugs solve, I say is not a problem in the first place. And it's, you know, it's also true that the bugs don't, don't do anything for it. They don't burrow, but I don't want to go there. I know you can find a species of, of sow bug that burrows because there's like 10,000 species of isopods, some of which live under the, in the ocean. I actually got to hold one of those ones. It's huge. The only other point, you sort of concluded with the notion that um, that your complex bioactive systems are more stable. You said that you, they're designed to last four or five years. You didn't say why this won't last four or five years. And that's, remember, what we're comparing here. We're comparing this with the complex bioactive. I don't think, I don't see any reason why this wouldn't last four or five years. I have bioactive vivariums that have lasted four years and they were going great guns at the end of that time. I was cutting back the plants all the time. So you, again, you have to say why this won't last. If you're making an argument that your system is better because it lasts a long time, you'll have to explain why this one doesn't. I think this one will. The other thing I'll say about that, this whole thing, I call this my one actor, one hour, bioactive build, and I have a video. I didn't, I messed up the video, but it's, I say it's a one hour build as an example. It actually only took about 30 minutes. So if this only lasted two years, right? 30 minutes to rebuild it is not much of a, to ask, really. And the final point that I think that you wrapped up with is that your systems are like nature. They are complex. And we talked about why that isn't, that's not, that's a fallacy to, to link those two is good. But also, the, the actually, the stability does not come from the complexity. I think if you look into it, you'll see that complexity, complex systems are more likely to fail. For every layer of complexity you add to a system is a, is a potential failure, right? And so in your case, you have your humidity, a good chunk of your humidity comes from your misting system, which is important to your system. But you have nozzles that can get clogged. You have tubing that can come loose. You have an electric motor that can fail. Electrical can fail. You know, you have all of these points of failure. And so it isn't more stable. It's much more likely to fail, much more um, uh, unstable. In this system, the simple system, the humidity comes up from below. You water it. You give it one week, two weeks, three weeks, it depends. Some of these back here, I water every three weeks. This one, the humidity um, under the bark, still 99%. I probably can't see that. The humidity under the plant over there has dropped to 91%. The humidity on top of the rock has dropped to 56%, okay? So what that tells me is that we're, this has been about a week now, maybe five, five days. And it's getting to the point where I would, I missed it with, when I fed them, I'd hand mist it. And in another five or six or seven days, I'd add water to it. Unless the laws of physics change, this humidity will always be available. All I have to do is just replenish it once a week or so. So those, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Simple is stable. I think that's everything. We need to go, I think you said you wanted to go to drainage systems next, which is fine. You don't have to do it. I just said 24 hours, if it takes you 48 or so, that's fine. I know we have other things to do with our lives. So take your time. The only thing I thought is that the substrate might want to be, it might be kind of part of the system 
you know, the misting, the substrate, the drainage might be part of the system to look at altogether, but you do whatever you want and I'll wait for your response and thanks a lot. I appreciate your time, appreciate your thoughts. It's good.